Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, so today I want to sort of, what I'd like to do is outline a conceptual path whereby we can start from some microscopic regulated degrees of freedom, filter degrees of freedom, or last moment degrees of freedom without, without any sign of gravity, and potentially go all the way to constructing some kind of space time in which the geometry is dynamical and obeys Einstein's equations. That's an ambitious program, and in fact, as you'll see, we won't really succeed completely. But what I hope to convince you of today is that this program is interesting, that it's plausible, and to tell you some of the more important results that we have along the way. And one more thing I should say is that my background is condensed matter theory, so gravity is a sort of more of a hobby, although a serious hobby. And uh, so I'm going to try to start from a more condensed matter oriented place and then hopefully end at some familiar <coughs> meditation and stuff. Okay. So probably, yeah, so, here, so here's the trajectory. I'm going to start out with some microscopic degrees of freedom, which, which just called qubits to emphasize that they're sort of elementary and very well defined. And then via something which I call the entanglement network, or an entanglement network, We'll start from these microscopic degrees of freedom and go to something like the equation that entanglement encodes geometry. And then by studying the dynamics of entanglement, purely from the CFT, and using this equation, plus some extra stuff, we will derive Einstein's equations. That's the trajectory. Okay. So, um, and let me just, probably everyone here knows this, but let me just, uh, so we're all on the same page. And uh, this has nothing to do with failing this. Gravity from entropy business? No, not, not as far as I know. Okay. But you should ask him. I, I don't think it does. Okay. <laughs> so, why is gravity weird um, from a kind of matter perspective? If I want to know what the energy of this table is, I need to look everywhere in the table, right? I can't just look far away if there was no gravity. But in a world with gravity, I can measure the total mass of the universe by looking at infinity. So, in that sense, the Hamiltonian is some really asymptotic property of the system that we're very familiar with. And that already hints that somehow in, in a gravitational system, I should be looking at the boundary and not the bulk. I think Newton could have been holographic if he had thought about this enough, but maybe he needed Einstein too, I'm not sure. <coughs> the second clue, of course, is that black holes have entropy, but it's proportional to their area, not to their volume. So again, that clues you in that in some fundamental sense, the Hilbert space of or the space of states in a quantum gravitational theory is proportional to the area and not to the volume. That is some kind of asymptotic property. And so then the question which arises is if everything is sort of holographic, everything lives on the boundary, then what is the meaning of the bulk direction? And the simplest, the most naive idea comes from thinking about kind of gravitational redshift experiments where you have a heavy body you have an atom which emits photons at some natural frequency. If that atom was sitting out in infinity, it would emit photons of energy E0. If it's sitting down the potential well of this big, massive body, then it emits some photon, which when it reaches infinity, has a different energy. So, and this energy is just the gravitationally redshifted value of the, the asymptotic energy. And so, in a sense, we could say that this direction here, the radial direction, encodes energy scale. That's the basic holographic story in a nutshell. So now I want to make a sort of well-defined microscopic starting what point. What do you mean exactly by energy scale? Can you open a little bit on that library? Uh, Maybe if you hold for just a few moments, mm -hmm. I'll give you a much more precise picture of what I'm going to do. Okay. But ask me again if you're not happy in a few slides. So the, the starting point, I'm going to sort of assume it's holographic. So the microphysics is defined in fewer dimensions, at least naively, naively defined means the, 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 in one way of looking at it is defined in less dimensions. So it's holographic. And then in order to have a big space, if, if radial direction is energy scale, then I'm going to need to have degrees of freedom on all scales in order to have a big space. That seems like a plausible statement. And of course, I'm really just beating around the bush. I'm going to basically be trying to you know, 
derive or make plausible some version of ADS CSD. And then entanglement is going to play a crucial role. And the reason why is because we have this black hole area equals entropy formula. But more generally, we would like to say that if geometry more generally is related to some kind of entropy, the question is what entropy might that be? And I'll try to convince you that the right entropy is entanglement. And again, we already sort of know that on the holographic side from the Ryutakinagi formula and various other works, but we want to sort of derive it here from, from, from first principles. So here's some kind of a cartoon of quantum many body physics, which I can call, we can call global quantum matter. And the idea is the following we have, well, let's say I have three ingredients. The first is a local regulated Hilbert space. So that means I have a bunch of spins or qubits or matrices or whatever arranged in some pattern in space. And regulated means that there's a five dimensional Hilbert space on every site. So you truncate things to make everything well defined. You can, you can have infinite dimensional spaces if you want, but, but not much is gained from that. The second thing is you have a local Hamiltonian, which means these degrees of freedom only talk to their neighbors or their second neighbors or their third neighbors out to some finite amount, and they don't talk beyond that. And the third thing is that there's no obvious gravity. So it's just, a, it's just a spin chain. So a simple canonical example in one dimension is the Heisenberg model, where I have spin a halves on every site. And they talk to each other in this anti-ferromagnetic. That means that they want to anti-align. You see the energy is lowered if they are anti-parallel. So this Hamiltonian would favor these spins classically to just line up like this in an alternating pattern as you go down the chain. So this is the kind of thing, I'm not specifically talking about this model, but this is an example of the kind of model we like to think of. And again, to have a big space, you need lots of entanglement of all energy scales, so we focus on CFDs. And to do the simplest possible thing to begin with, we think about the ground state. That would be correspond to empty space. Is there a notion of space here, uh, like the spacing between the two spins? Um, like one dimensional lattice? Yeah, yeah, I'll say it's a lattice. So there's not necessarily an intrinsic meaning to this distance, but but there will be some kind of continuum description, let's say, where there is a motion of you know, geometry. But yeah, at, at, at the lattice scale, it doesn't matter how far apart I draw these blocks. Everything is defined in terms of the Hamiltonian. So the question I want to ask now is, how does the entanglement look like in such a system? And then, okay, there are many possibilities. So let's again have our lattice of spins here. The simplest thing you could think about would be, well, the simplest possible state would be a product state where all the spins do something independently of each other. Right? So that's like this anti ferromagnetic pattern that I talked about before. And this spin is up, and this spin is down, and this spin is up, and this spin is down, and that's a product state. That has no entanglement whatsoever. But you could imagine a state with slightly, just a little bit of entanglement between neighboring degrees of freedom. So that's what I sketched here. These red blobs are meant to be singlets, or some kind of uh, collective state of these two degrees of freedom. So this, this sort of nearest neighbor singlet state, where every pair of spins is paired up, that's what we could call a short range entangled state. When you say paired up, what's the difference between the previous situation, one up, one down? Well, it, here, here it's, you know, it's a position of up, down, and down, up. So there's some entanglement. Right, that the, the, the wave function of the composite system can be written as a product I of the, the two waves. At each side, you don't have only up. Exactly. It's a combination of like a and then tangled with the next guy. Yes, precisely. But then, of course, we can repeat the story. We can imagine, you know, maybe it's not these neighbors, but, but collections of four or, or so on. So we can have longer and longer and so on range entanglement in this quantum many body system. And just, I'm not going to actually make much use of this, but the way we typically measure how much entanglement is in the system is using the entanglement entropy, which is defined this way. So you take the reduced density matrix of a region, that is, you take the state of the whole system, you trace out the outside, you just take the state of the middle that you're interested in, and you compute its binomial entropy. And that's the entanglement entropy. And this entropy essentially tells you how many singlets, how many of these red blobs are shared between the region and its so it just measures how much entanglement there is. So the picture, 
that I want you to have in this slide is that, is that in principle we could have a hierarchical structure of entanglement where we have short ranged, longer ranged, still longer ranged, and so on. And the system has an energy gap if it's a massive theory, then maybe the amount of entanglement stops at some point, which is related to the correlation link, for example. Or if it's a conformal field theory that has some massless degrees of freedom, then maybe the entanglement goes on forever. That is arbitrarily long wavelength modes are entangled. Hello. And now, yeah. may I ask one question? Yeah. Uh, here, assume we only have short, short, uh, short range interaction at the tree level, and then the narrow range interaction can appear when we consider the quantum look, look, quantum look, look effect, right? Okay. So, no, now my question is what's the relationship between the entanglement and the quantum loop effect? What is the relationship between entanglement and quantum Yeah, because um, the line range inter in interaction can also appear when we introduce the quantum loop effect for the spin chain. Well, let's say if, if, if you only have, when you have, if you have, a, if you have a loop where you have some long range thing, that means there's a massless mode in your system, right? So I can just say that in this language is saying that that long range interaction is giving rise to a long range entanglement, but I can equally well say that's just because there's some massless mode that has entanglement of all energy scales. I think there's a, a essentially tight connection between those two things. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thanks. This yeah. thing should be calculated, but can be calculated by Jordan being the transformation. So sorry, which which thing? The entropy? This is quantity for the model which you formulate. Okay. Oh yeah, sure. For yeah, for that okay. model, everything is computable. Something instructive? Yes, it's instructive. In fact, I'll show you a picture in a moment about how to actually understand what the entanglement is. Okay, so we'd like to weaponize this picture, turn it into something useful. Maybe weaponize is the wrong word, but we're peaceful people. But anyways, so. So the, what we want to do is actually take this intuition and turn it into a variational wave function, which can capture the physics of interest. <laughs> and the way the variational wave function works is that we imagine we have, let me describe it in the inverse direction, where I tell you the state, and I tell you a procedure to take that arbitrary state and turn it into a product state. So I tell you how to disentangle it. Or you can think about going the other direction, starting from a product state and building in correlations at, at different energy scales and that would produce a variational wave function for your system. So the way it works is you take your state on the purple blobs, and there's an iterative procedure where you first remove some entanglement, that's what these blue rectangles are supposed to be doing. So they're unitary transformations acting between pairs of spins. And their job is to remove some entanglement. And the goal of this reduction of entanglement is that at the end of the day you want a coarse grain. You want to factor out some unentangled degrees of freedom. So think about this as removing short range entanglement. Then some degrees of freedom are unentangled, and you can coarse grain. That's what this step is doing. So you're factoring out unentangled degrees of freedom. And then you have a new state on half as many spins here. And you can do the same thing. You can again remove short range entanglement, which is now at a longer scale in the original lattice. And you can again coarse grain, and you can repeat this procedure. So this we could call an entanglement network. So it's a network of unitary transformations which map the wave function of interest to product states, which has a hierarchical structure. So in other words, it encodes some kind of coarse graining picture of the correlations in your, in your quantum state. <coughs> and to say this, this kind of network was first introduced by Guifre Vidal. It has a name called MIRA, which stands for Multi-Scale Entanglement Renormalization Ansatz. But don't worry about that. It's just a network which encodes entanglement in the quantum state. And here I've drawn a network which is sort of supposed to look scale ingrained. So you can imagine if the system has a mass gap, this network proceeds for a while until you reach the correlation length and then it stops. That is, you run out of correlations. Or if the state is a conformal state, if it has degrees of freedom at all scales, the network can continue forever until you reach, until your whole system is shrunk to a point or just forever if you have Okay, and now let me just make an aside. As a condensed matter person, why we care about such a thing? And the reason, one reason why we care is that it's, it's very useful computationally. So for example, suppose you want to know the expectation value of a local operator. You want to know the expectation value of the energy density or the magnetization 
That's a, a quantity of some interest in experimental physics. You can compute this expectation value using computational resources that scale like the log of the system size to some power, and this bond dimension, which means the number of degrees of freedom on these lines, so the dimension of the Hilbert space, basically, to some polynomial power, the local Hilbert space. And this, this, is, this is quite favorable scaling in principle. So if, for example, you were doing a Monte Carlo calculation, it might be polynomial in system size, or even exponential if you have a sign problem. But here, you get, rather, you get a rather, rather modest scale. So if such a wave function exists, then it's usually possible to compute physical quantities of interest efficiently. And there's a reason for this, which is just that the way it's made of these unitary transformations, whenever you calculate something like a norm, all the v's and the bra and the v dagger and the ket, they cancel to give you identity. And so everything cancels out and the calculation becomes trivial. Whereas if you look at a local operator, then almost all the terms cancel, just a few remain. And that's where this estimate comes from. So if you had a wave function like this for QCD, and there's no reason, in fact, I'll show you in a second, we can prove that it exists, then you can, in principle, do calculations much more efficiently than with Monte Carlo, at least if you're interested in ground state quantities. So this is why, as a kinetic matter person, we might be interested in such a network, because it enables us to calculate quantities of interest in only a couple of systems much more efficiently than we could otherwise. And just as an, as, as an example of this, this is work by Gifre Vidal and Glenn Edenbley, Here's your model again. This is a, a different version, a different version of the uh, Heisenberg chain. So here we're in one spatial dimension. The Z is the poly Z, so it's a ferromagnetic interaction here. And here's an X, it's a poly X. It's a transverse field, so it's just the transverse field Ising model. We know that if G is equal to one, this is a CFT with known primary fields. So here I'm just showing that the way you do this thing is you take this network here, you start with all the tensors random. You variationally optimize them all, sweeping through the network to find the lowest possible energy. Then you use that network to calculate observables using something like this. And here are some results. What's plotted here are scaling dimensions of various primary fields. You see there's identity, there's the spin field, there's energy. And so you get all these CFT values very precisely with minimal computation. Now, of course, this is a you know, pretty trivial example. It's just, a, it's just a proof of principle. But this is sort of what we like to do. To take a, 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 a model which is not understood and actually do the variation calculation or, or by any other method, find the wave function and calculate physical quantities. But that's going to matter. Let's, let's not worry about that. Let's move on. Um, let me just mention that there is an improved version of this, which John McGreevy and I cooked up, where we see here the key thing is you have local, everything is like local unitary transformation, so it's strictly local circuits. You can generalize this to turn it into some kind of local Hamiltonian evolution instead of a circuit. So just take a circuit and turn it into a local Hamiltonian. I don't want to dwell on this, some technical thing. Well, there are important conceptual insights here, but let me not worry about it too much. So the idea, again, though, is that you take a system on fewer sites, say the black sites, you put in unentangled degrees of freedom, that's these blue degrees of freedom here, you mix them up with a local unitary transformation, and that produces your wave function on a bigger system. So it's just doing this, this again, you start with some, your wave function on some degrees of freedom here, you add in unentangled degrees of freedom there, you mix them up, and you make the wave function on a bigger system. It's the same thing, but with some important advances over the mirror. And uh, here are some movies. So this is, uh, the first thing is a picture as a function. This is energy as a function of momentum. This is a single particle fermion problem. And what I'm showing you are different bands, energy bands, so energy levels of these fermions. This system is what's called a churn insulator, which means that it has uh, uh, quantum Hall effect, so if you apply a voltage this way, you get a current this way. It's the same as a Dirac fermion in two plus one dimensions, so it has a, has a Chern-Simons term in its effective action. 
And this is just a show, this is just a movie showing that we can deform these bands in such a way that you go from the system on four sites to the system on two sites without closing the gap. So there's a way to do an idiomatic transformation from system size L to system size L over two, and that enables us to construct this Mara circuit for this situation. And in fact, for field theories, there's a universal prescription. Take any gap field theory, for example. As long as you can place it on an expanding universe without closing the gap, then there is a way to construct this local unitary, which I said, the circuit which takes you from L to 2L, which is more or less the adiabatic motion along that path. So just some, some simple examples. The point of all this is just to say that we have actually rigorous theorems saying that for all gap field theories or a wide class of gap lattice systems, this Mara circuit exists. So it just exists full stop, independent of the dynamics. This includes things like lattice QCD, we believe, on a Paul, another interesting case. This is only for gap systems, but actually we now have a proof for gapless systems as well, for some class of gapless systems, which we call square root states. So I can tell you more about this offline if you want. And we strongly believe it's true for CFTs as well. Every, all the structure is there. They're, we're just missing it. I, there's just some holes in our complete proof. But we strongly believe that it will be true. And so the message you should take away is that these networks, these entanglement networks, they just exist. For CFTs, for gap systems, for non-relativistic theories, they all have such a network, it seems. Oh, this means um, that you can deform space without closing the gap. So like, for a field theory, for a quantum field theory, this is sort of obvious. You know, if you have a gap, you could adiabatically deform the metric and nothing would happen. There are certain lattice models where this is not guaranteed, certain very complicated lattice models. So we, we put this liquid condition in to put those aside. In fact, they also have entanglement networks, but just more complicated networks. So don't worry about the details, the point is just to take away that these networks exist. So this picture I drew is a picture you can safely internalize for almost anything you care about, as long as you're interested in ground state physics. Okay. So now, that was sort of the beginning part, it's sort of the condensed matter motivation. That's why we care about it. But why, why is this talk about gravity at all? And that's because these networks have a very intriguing property that the geometry of the network encodes entanglement in a nice way. So here's the way that works. So here and now I have again my network, but I have sort of abstracted it a little bit. So I have a bunch of sites at the top. I'm doing a two to one coarse graining scheme at every every time, and so all these all these lines represent an abstraction of those unitaries I was applying before. So I'm taking two degrees of freedom to one, two to one, two to one, two to one, and so on. That's hierarchical fashion. So this is just a shorthand for the network I showed you before. And this network has an interesting property. Suppose I want to know how much entanglement exists between the region between the two red dots and the outside world. That's the question I want to answer. How much entanglement is there? Well, there's an easy answer in this, in this network. The answer is the entanglement is bounded by the minimum number of bonds in the network you have to cut to isolate this region from the outside world. So for example, you could cut the bonds like this bond, all these bonds here, like that. That would be a bound, which is proportional to the linear size of this subregion. But a much more efficient way to do it is to go down in the network. Got this bond, this bond, this bond, this bond, and so on like that. This path which goes down cuts much fewer bonds for a large region than the path which goes straight across. And the minimum number that you can cut is a bound of the entropy. And in fact, numerically, we typically find that this bound is sharp, that is, it's proportional to the number of bonds. <coughs> and the proportionality factor is related to the so-called bond dimension, that is, how many degrees of freedom are running along each of these lines. So it's just the Hilbert space dimension. And so the message of this slide is that 
entanglement entropy obeys an area law. Yeah, that is a proportional some kind of boundary, but not in the original lattice, in a different graph geometry, which is associated with like a renormalization group history of the quantum state. So one more time, the entanglement entropy of this region in the boundary. But it's, it's conceptually a big jump to throw in the word renormalization and so on and so forth. You're really counting here, spin up, spin down. How does the concept of normalization come No, so yeah, I, I didn't say that word before, but this idea of coarse graining, you know, from two to one, mm -hmm. I think of really as a real space wave function normalization. So it's, 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 well, okay, we can discuss whether it's different or not from Wilsonian, you know, Euclidean renormalization. I mean, it's certainly different, but whether it captures different physics or not, we can, we can discuss. But I really want to think of it as some kind of a normalization group scheme which acts in real space on the real time, you know, the Minkowski wave function, and defines a way that you can sort of take your system at some given size L or can change it to a system at size L over 2 or to 2L. So it's just a scaling transformation. So that's why I use the word normalization. And in fact, it's, you know, you can check, as I said, you can calculate these operator spectrum, you know, it sort of matches what you get from original RG picture. So, so there's a pretty close correspondence. So this is, this is the interesting message of this slide is that entanglement is controlled by some kind of boundary in some geometry, but not the original geometry. Excuse me. Yeah. What goes up the tree the other way around? Isn't there some fractal this form if I didn't have these cross links, then this is a Cayley tree. Like where every node has a, every node has a certain number of um, neighbors, and there's no loops. Right. So you can see if I didn't have the cross links, every node would have three neighbors, and just keeps expanding up and expanding up. So that's that's one um, answer that it may not be the one you're thinking about, but, or beta lattice is sometimes called. But maybe it's yeah. So so if one doesn't one doesn't stop. Does does one end up with some fractal uh, in the end with some fractal damage? It's yeah, one doesn't thing. stop. I thought it's something in the Sierpinski tree or something, but maybe. Oh, Sierpinski triangle, or Sierpinski gasket. Sorry, it's, it's not, it's not Yeah, I, I, if I understand correctly, I think it's not exactly the same thing. But it is true that the geometry of this graph is not, you know, Euclidean. And it, it, I, I would say it's, I would say it's not so much fractals, but more like infinite dimensional, in the sense that areas and volumes are all kind of studying the same way. It's, it's hyperbolic, I mean, ultimately. So um, just an ex this is just an example to show, another example to show that it's not all a one-dimensional story. So a very interesting situation, again, in condensed matter physics, although also in high energy, is to consider discrete gauge theories. These are interesting simplified models of various kinds of interesting phase conditions that can occur in gauge systems. And the simplest possible gauge theory to consider is a Z2 gauge theory, defined on some lattice. And this is just a, a slide which shows you how to take that gauge theory to find on the lattice where here you have degrees from on links. And there's a, there's a well-defined simple way you can figure out where you can decouple different links. So you can essentially change the lattice structure. That is by, you can remove, for example, this middle link. And this change of lattice structure can be bootstrapped into a normalization procedure remove you know, a certain number of links everywhere in the lattice, and then you're left with a, a sparser lattice. So this is just a decimation procedure where you can take the wave function on this five-side thing and turn it into a wave function on the four-side thing plus an unentangled state. So it works in, in higher dimensions as well. I already proved it. I, well, I didn't prove it. I showed you a theorem which says that's true, but here's an explicit example. But an interesting thing about this example is that you 
can also think now about excitations. So far I was talking only about the ground state. But the Z2 gauge theory has excitations. It has magnetic excitations. It also has electric excitations. So electric particles can be by a Wilson line or pairs of magnetic fluxes. And in fact, there's a way to produce all those excitations using the network as well. Where what you do now is, remember I had these little zeros, these unentangled degrees of freedom at the bottom. If you take them all to be zero, you get the ground state. If you flip some of them, you take zero to one, or up to down, then you get an excited state. And in fact, how big that excited state is on the boundary corresponds to where in the network you flip the spin. So if you flip the spin, you know, L layers down, then that thing will correspond to some excitation, which is a size order E to the L on the down. Because it goes up, doubling in size every time. So there's a nice kind of, in this toy model, a nice realization of, again, sort of energy scale or length scale and radial direction, this nice duality in ADS-CFT. It's very concretely realized here. Whereas the further down you go, you flip some, flip some spin and make an excitation, that corresponds to a bigger and bigger excitation on the down. And so we need one more piece from this story, which is, suppose I did have these excited states, suppose I have these excitations. How do they contribute to the entanglement? So I already told you the network itself gives you some entanglements because of these disentanglers. But these excited states can also contribute. So for example, suppose instead of having zero and zero here, here's A and its complement, I have, instead of zero, zero, I have this entanglement state of zero, zero plus one, one. In that case, what you can show, it doesn't appear yet, but it, it'll appear soon, I hope. Maybe, maybe before Christmas, maybe not. What you can show is that in this case, the entropy of region A is now equal to the network value plus an extra log two due to this singlet. So remember I told you the entropy is count number of singlets. And this network value is what you'd get in a network with all zeros. And then when you add this extra entanglement to bulk degrees of freedom, zeros become entangled, then you get an extra log two. And so the picture is that in this network, you have sort of area entanglement, and you can also entangle your bulk degrees of freedom and get some long range entanglement from those. And these things, roughly speaking, add. So now, let's make a little bit of a leap. And here, I, I emphasize extra assumptions are now needed. Everything I've told you up to this point is actually, we believe, completely generic for any CFT in any dimension. But now, if we really want to make contact with understood properties of holography, we're going to need extra stuff. So if we want to take this discrete, look how everything's color-coded, so the red is the red, the blue is the blue, this is what's supposed to match. If we want to take this discrete geometry and it's not as discrete as it looks. There's, there's, you know, for example, you can rewire this thing in various ways. So it's not so discrete, but it is discrete. And you want to sort of really turn it into a continuum bulk. That's what we'd like to do. And, and I emphasize that we don't understand how to do this completely, or even very well at all. There are some, there's a little bit of understanding that if, for example, the tensors, the unitary transformations should appear in this network if they're quasi-random, if they're strongly mixing, for example, then you you start to have this network look more like this continuous space. In terms of the spectrum of operator dimensions, there's a gap in the scaling spectrum, and entropy is, has some nice properties. But I emphasize this as a leap. So we're going to take this as inspiration. That we have a CFT, there is a way to make some kind of entanglement network, where entanglement is, is controlled by the geometry of the network. And if I have bulk degrees of freedom, those degrees of freedom living inside the network, that they can also entangle, and their contribution adds to the area of this. Yes? For a mathematician, what is the, the kind of geometry? How is it known to mathematicians? This geometry? Top one, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I guess it's some kind of net, like a graph geometry. Graph geometry. Yeah. If you have a, like a, you could put a taxi cab metric, you know, just count the number of links to connect any two regions. So one thing you can do, for example, is to study diffusion on this network, like graph diffusion. And you can show that the eigenvalues of the graph Laplacian are the same as the eigenvalues in this space. So in the same way that diffusion on a square lattice, if you look at you know, long times and big regions, looks like it's diffusion in just flat space. 
Will there be a metric actually? Uh, well, if you can define a metric, yes. How unique is that? It's not unique. So that, that's part of the issue is that we don't know really how to, there's no one obvious way to take this thing. The Hamiltonian doesn't uh, determine. No, I don't think so. The there are many choices. One choice would be, for example, the, the metric is determined by the entropy. Just you just define, you know, the link size to be the entropy that it adds, for example. Mm. Or you could you could take some, you know you could use a correlation function. There's there's a lot of choices. You can always hide hide behind the excuse of quantization scheme. As if, uh, <laughs> it's convenient to escape. Yeah. Or maybe the one that gives the right limit, continuous limit, maybe. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah. yeah I, yeah, I, I don't. I really don't understand this this sufficiently well. But I think this is this is really an area where much progress can be made in this story. So for the remaining twenty minutes or so, I want to take this picture and try to get from it to Einstein's equations. Good luck. <laughs> So, here, so here's what I want to do the, the, for the remainder. So I, I hope I've motivated, at least schematically, I, I know I didn't convey any details of what I was saying, but as a, as a broad picture, hopefully I convinced you that it's reasonable to start with the following set of assumptions. That for certain class of states in the conformal field theory of interest, let's think this is N equals 4 super Yang Mills or whatever, <coughs> your favorite holographic CFT. This is dual, meaning exactly equivalent to a geometry M, along with some quantum state for bulk degrees of freedom. And within this correspondence, the way you calculate entropy of a region in that CFT state is by looking for the surface A tilde, which is minimal in this geometry, the bulk geometry, calculating its area over 4G Newton, and adding to it the entropy of the bulk degrees of freedom the entanglement should be of the bulk degrees of freedom in this region with those outside. So that's what I'm going to assume from now on. That I have a geometry, and that within this geometry, the entropy of A is the area of A tilde plus the entanglement entropy of the fields inside this region sigma with the fields outside. So just like in our world, if I have an electron here, an electron there, and they're entangled, then the total entropy, this, this, this region with that region, is that a little electron entanglement plus the area of that region. That's the assumption. And the, the area being a gravitational piece and the sort of electron piece being this matter bit. So you're taking the geometry plus the metric is good. Or... Well, the, the metric in principle is also fluctuating, so it's in here. But yeah, I have some semi-classical geometry plus quantum fluctuation of it. But I, I emphasize it's a semi-classical picture, so it's not. this is not meant to you know, be a full definition of quantum gravity. So this is this is the Ryu Takinagi formula, and then this contribution was considered first by Faulkner, Lukowitz, and Malkasena, at least in this containment free context. But here we're not deriving it, we're just assuming it. We're just assuming this equation with the, the derivation or the, the plausibility argument being the preceding 40 minutes of the talk. Okay, and now what we're going to do is look at something, some standard for dynamics. So on the CFT side, we start with the ground state, and we make a small perturbation here. So this epsilon is, it's like a small shift in the Hilbert space state, so not small energy, but really small change in your position in Hilbert space. And on the gravity side, we assume that corresponds to a small change in the metric, H, mu, and a small change in the bulk state. And so a question in the field theory side of how does the entanglement entropy change under this deformation turns into the gravity side as to how the metric changes along the field theory. And the crucial purely CFT fact that we're going to use is called the entanglement first law. And it's easiest to state for, for balls. So we're going to focus on a ball of radius r in any dimension. So here at the region A, henceforth will be called B with radius r and point x naught on the boundary. And for this region, it's actually known that the corresponding bulk region is always a hemisphere. This is a simple fact about hyperbolic geometry. 
And in that case, we have, a, we have an equation which relates the change in entropy under a small change in the state to a change in some, in some energy, which is not the usual energy, but something called the modular energy. So here's the definition of the change in entropy. You just take that row log row formula and calculate its first derivative. That's what appears here. And here's the definition of delta EB. There's 2 pi. There's integral over this region B with some weighting factor and then the change in the expectation value of the CFT energy. So we're going to use this equation on the CFT side to constrain the gravitational increase of freedom and show essentially that this equation turns into Einstein's equation. And just let me tell you briefly why is this region B special? Why is it so nice? Well, the reason is that the boundary region B here, and it's called diamond, supports a conformal killing field, which I write here. And correspondingly, the bulk region sigma supports an ordinary killing field. And this Kelly field is just a combination of, of special conformal transformation, time direction, and time translation. And so this null surface here is horizon of this boundary conformal killing field, and then there's corresponding surface in the bulk, which is the horizon of the bulk killing field. So if you like more, this, this region is chosen because it's sort of like a black hole. And so in that, in that, in fact, if you made this a black hole, there's a coordinates where this is what's called a hyperbolic black hole. This would just be the statement of the black hole first law. This would be the black hole first law. Entropy is equal to energy. Or change of is equal to change of energy. So that's why it's special. There's a lot of symmetry which lets us compute in a nice way. So here's the way it works. This is, again, the CFT first law. And let, me, let me first ignore the matter. So I just talk about the area piece. Can I claim without proof, if you want the proof, look in Iyer and Wald, or this paper by Faulkner. So this builds on earlier work by Lashkari et al. and Faulkner. These are both works of Mark and Armstrong. There's my collaborator on this part. There exists a differential form chi such that the change in the area here is integral of chi over B tilde. And this is the minimal surface. And the reason why this formula is true is because this B tilde is minimal. So there's a principal variation with respect to the surface and with respect to the metric. The variation with respect to the surface vanishes because it's minimal. So all you get is, is this is essentially H. There's some, some nice way of packaging H in here. It's a variation of the metric, and you integrate it over the minimal surface. And that's how the area changes. Similarly, if you want to calculate the energy variation, you take the same form, you integrate it now over the boundary, and that gives you the change in the energy. And this is again plausible. We know the stress tensor of the of the of the uh, CFT is related to some boundary value of the metric, and so it's the same H. And here it gives you the change in that boundary. And then the crucial thing is that the derivative of this form is proportional to the equation of motion. This is delta E super G sub AB. This is I or wall notation. And here is C, this, this bulk killing field that I was telling you about. And epsilon is just a, just a volume point. And so this says that if the equation of motion is satisfied, then this form has a vanishing derivative. And so these two things are equal. Because you can make a closed loop out of them. So that's the content of the Faulkner et al. paper. And what this gives you is it says that, assuming you have the CFT first law, that is these two things, this is equal to that, then the bulk equation, the, the bulk of metric has to obey the linearized Einstein equation with no matter. So you get three gravitons on the background of the Can one hope for getting the full nonlinear Einstein someday? Yeah, just wait. Okay. I mean, I won't really do it, but yes, I think one can hope for that. Mm -hmm. But the first step is to include matter. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do here. So now we look at the variation of the matter piece, that is the bulk entanglement. And here, again, the formula is that previously we said, we said uh, that we had the, the boundary 
state varying, right? Delta sigma B. Here, we're letting the bulk state vary, delta rho sub sigma. It's the same formula, but now we're using the bulk quantum field theory, if you like, including gravity. But as a as a view as a field theory on some fixed background. And again, the variation with to the surface is zero for symmetry reasons. I can prove this. But now there's a very nice thing. Just like we knew to the way that this formula here works, we calculated log rho to be this weird weighted integral of the stress tensor. That's what log rho was. So log, log rho is like e to some energy, where that energy is not the ordinary energy, but some so-called modular energy, which is the energy density weighted by a weird factor. And here, the same pathological argument, which gives you this, which is essentially just a version of Unruh's derivation, you know, the Unruh Weiss derivation of, of the Unruh effect, the same argument tells you that the log of the bulk density matrix in the bulk ground state is equal to the integral of the bulk stress tensor with this bulk killing field over the region signal. And this is essentially the statement that the bulk region is a window. So in other words, you know, this, is the, this is the derivation I'm talking about, imaginary time, space. I want the density matrix on this half space, row phi plus phi minus. I want this density matrix. And what I do is I integrate over the plane. I close the integral over here. And then instead of doing an integral this way, I do the integral radially, right? So I get the boost generator. I go this way. And so that's, what we're, that's what's actually being done here. This is the analog of the generator of boost. It's the generator of this symmetry of the bulk state. But well, this calculation seems to be so far model independent, right? You haven't picked any particular CFT. Uh, yeah, this, this is true for any bulk quantum field theory. Any bulk quantum field wave function can be calculated by path integral. Do you not need to know a specific map between the particular CFT and particular bulk theory? I mean, how general is it? I think it's pretty general. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the point. Is that I just need to assume that there is this correspondence between entropy in the field theory and entropy in the bulk, mm -hmm. and that the bulk state can be prepared by a path integral. So I don't tell you, you know, I don't tell you the list of all <coughs> these things, but any particular one for which it works, as long as these two assumptions are satisfied, mm -hmm. then this derivation goes through. Can you assure us that there are no infinities in these integrals? Are they really finite? They well defined. Uh, yes, I think they are. Uh, yeah, because what's what you're calculating here, in principle, the entropy itself is a very divergent thing, but this change in entropy is a much better behaved quantity. Mm -hmm. And so there's a complicated story about about regularizing and normalizing the entanglement entropy in the bulk in terms of shif shifting it over into the area piece. So this is like Susskind and Ublum, you know, we're normalizing Newton's constant kind of story. So I don't, I didn't talk about that at all. But I assume it can be done, but but actually for these purposes, it doesn't even matter because you're just calculating variations, and for those finite variations, these issues don't enter. You need to be a little careful about the regulator, the UV, I mean the infrared regulator, in the gravity. So this quantity can, in principle, diverge because of the infinite volume. But that's a sort of understood issue which we can take here. Mm -hmm. So here's the result that the change in the bulk entanglement entropy is proportional to this killing field integrated against the bulk energy density. So now we're, we're almost done. Here's the argument in a few lines zero equals delta s minus delta e. That's the CFT first law just follows from CFT principles. Then we convert to holographic variables. So we turn everything in using our dictionary into the holographic language. Then we use the variations I showed you before. So the variation of the area parts is here, the integral of chi over B tilde. Here's the variation of the bulk entanglement, which is calculated. Then here's the variation of delta E. Sorry, here's the variation of E. Then B and B tilde, remember, B, here's B tilde. When I subtract them, I have a complete integral. So I can use Stokes' theorem. 
and combine this piece and this piece into a d chi. But remember, d chi is proportional to the equation of motion, the linearized equation. So we get this equation. This integrated equation gives zero for this particular ball B. But actually, it's valid for any ball. And with that, you can use that. You can use this validity for all balls to argue that the integrand vanishes. So this quantity in parentheses is equal to 0 0.54. And then here I did it in a particular Lorentz frame. You can boost to get all the field theory directions. And then the other directions, mu r and r r, are actually constraints. Which you can check that once they're satisfied at the boundary, they're satisfied in the bulk for sure. And at the boundary, they reduce to the conservation of the stress tensor and its tracelessness. So just some CFD property. And so at the end of the day, what you get is the linearized free graviton part is equal to the change, that is the additional energy over relative to the ground state that you get from variation of the bulk matter fields. So you get Einstein's equations linearized by ADS universally coupled to matter. And I emphasize the equivalence principle is manifest here, and it comes just from this universality of entanglement. In fact, the only thing which matters is the entanglement, the total entanglement of the bulk fields. Nothing else matters, just that total entanglement. And that immediately goes rise to the equivalence principle. That only a thing which appears here is the bulk stress tensor. So this is really what we derived. And I think that's that's most of the that's essentially the high point. But let me just say, since it was asked about the nonlinear extension, I don't think we really added much here, but let me just make a statement which is that. If you look for local nonlinear actions consistent with this linearized result and with the assumption of entanglement we had before, that is entanglement proportional to area, even away from ADS, then the only solution is Einstein's action universal coupled to matter. So in that sense, the nonlinear extension, that is this, this assumption that entanglement equals geometry is strong enough to single out Einstein's theory. Um, well, I, I, it should have a solution which is asymptotically ADS. That's our requirement. I, that's a requirement of what we did. I mean, we, we certainly, everything we do is perturbative about ADS. Rather, you can really relax that, I'm not sure. I mean, you get something, you know, you get the nonlinear equation, but you know, then you can change this line to be positive instead of negative and interpret that in the same way. It's clearly a very different theory. So maybe I should really think in terms of a universe where I have a fixed asymptotic background. Anything in the bulk can happen as I want, and it's governed by these nonlinear equations. But the background, you know, the asymptotic are fixed, and whether you can really go beyond that from this entanglement perspective is not clear. So again, with consistent with the linearized result and the entanglement assumption, this nonlinear action. And in fact, if you want to get something besides Einstein gravity, the solution is simple. Instead of taking the entropy is equal to area, you take entropy is equal to wall entropy. And then you get the associated higher derivative gravity. The internal symmetry? How would I get that? Internal symmetry. You, would, you mean like? Yeah, oh. In the bulk? Oh, I, I think you just put that in. I mean, you, just, you specify whatever bulk field theory you want. You have gravity plus. Essentially, unspecified any matter, any matter within reason that you want, and that that fitness works. At what stage in your derivation did you put in that it was Einstein number as opposed to some higher numbers? Was it the? It was the assumption that the entropy is proportional to the area. That's it. It's right here. This gives you Einstein numbers. If you put wall entropy here. Let's say it, so this is not the area it, it used to be it used to be not known what the entropy was for general higher derivative theories. Now we believe Shidong has well produced a solution for some situations at least. But at least for, for horizons, the entropy has to reduce to wall entropy. So if we assume that at least for horizons it was wall entropy, then this derivation would go through for the linearized equation, it would give you linearized high derivative, you know, appropriate to that wall entropy. Yeah, but wall entropy is not area. Quite. It's not area. That's what I'm saying. You have to change this area. If you change 
Area gives you Einstein, wall entropy gives you high derivative okay. theory. So this assumption was enough for instance to get the explicit form of chi. Yes. So in, in fact, yeah, if you do a high derivative theory, there's just a different chi. But I are all constructed in all the chi's. So, so yeah, it goes through. Yes. So I sense equations. So let me wrap up just by saying that I hope I convinced you that there's an interesting conceptual path here whereby in principle we could start from some completely regulated, well-defined, meaning puttable on a computer, degrees of freedom. And at the end of the day, after some sufficiently long trajectory, we, we can construct a semi-classical space with the right theory, which obeys Einstein's equations. And, but there are, of course, still many challenges. Uh, in particular, I think it's very interesting to understand better bulk locality below the ADS scale, which is not manifest in this network, and also the bulk continuum limits. And so without me, let me say thank you. So it looks like ADS is rather useful in uh, developing a quantum theory of gravity to understand yes. deep issues in it. But uh, the, the, in the real world, the, the sitter, uh, as in yes. when I mention this is at our lunch hours, <coughs> my colleagues remind me sometimes that uh, ADS is perfectly fine in the real world also. But I tend to forget the argument. Can you give me your take on this? Or how do we use uh, ADS? Uh, uh, asymptotics uh, in, in the real world. By real world, I mean four dimensional space time physics. I, I don't know. QCD is the answer, is that right? Um, you, you mean like, you mean use it to do like. Indirect. You mean indirect? I mean, actual quantum theory of gravity I'm after in 4D. Yeah. Now, when they say QCD, oh, no. no. I meant indirect. Indirectly. Okay, indirectly is one thing, but I mean, no, I don't... my colleague could be telling me that QCD will be living in 4D, actual world is uh, gravity within 5D, and it's okay for it to be ADS. Oh, yeah, so that's that fine. Sense? That's fine, yeah. Well, where's my Jusiter, uh, small, dis where's my small cosmological constant, positive there. one? I lost it. I don't where know. does it fit in? <laughs> <laughs> no, but that would just so I will it, it, grant you QCD in 4D, okay, as a boundary. I grant you that. But somewhere, somehow, I want to see a uh, small positive cosmological You want to constant. consider in 4D. I suppose. But yeah, only well, thing I will yield is whether gravity is localizing, uh, or is it um, a bulk phenomenon? You know, this, this. Yeah, for, for everything I've been talking about, you know, it's like we have a fixed quantum field theory, there's no gravity. So we just ignore the sitter, mm -hmm. and we just you know relate that to some auxiliary gravitational theory in one more dimension, and, you know the way you know very well. Okay. So there's no de sitter in this. Well, there may be a little de sitter, but not much de sitter in this story. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm afraid I missed some basic points on your entanglement network. Did you yeah. assume that your ground state is neighboring entanglement? Um, well, I gave a little cartoon, but in fact, if you, if you make the unitaries sufficiently large, uh -huh. then it doesn't matter. So, it, we have a theorem which says if you make the unitaries sufficiently large, like they act on, you know, instead of two sites, four sites, or six sites, some number, of, some finite number of sites, uh -huh. then you can get the ground state to high accuracy. Well, I, I, uh, well, how did you get go from zero to the assumption that uh, the area of your graph or your, your tree graph is kind of like tree graph? Uh, is uh, gives you the entanglement system. Well, so that, yeah, that's a, as long as these unitaries are are local, I can just coarse bring them into two side things. But where the sites are bigger, maybe they contain uh -huh. you know multiple sites. So the point is, it's always still a picture like I have a region, I have a network. And I have some unitary which connects these degrees of freedom and these and these. And every unitary that I slice through, you know, gives me a little bit of entropy. So that's what this that's what this formula I was talking about, this balance that comes from. It's saying every unitary that you, you know, which acts half on your system and half on the outside world gives you a little bit of entanglement.
that's why it's a boundary. So, so every, every one of them contains a piece of your original uh, series in kind of. Exactly, yeah. These made, they made themselves be a little bit coarse grained. Yeah. Okay. Is there no more questions? Let's take a Thank you.